today I have with me my colleague Kyle Caldwell, Collectives Editor at Interactive Investor, and someone who needs no introduction, Terry Smith, Founder, Chief Executive and Chief Investment Officer at Fundsmith, which includes the UK's largest investment fund, Fundsmith Equity. Hello, Terry. Delighted that you could join us today. Morning. Both yourself and Fundsmith Equity have had quite phenomenal success, and you're often referred to as the English Warren Buffett. Now, your approach is similar to the American, but are there any other investing legends that have shaped your approach or who have had a significant influence on you? Warren who? <laughs> Buffett, you might have heard of him. Uh, look, I've been reading uh, Warren Buffett's annual report and all of the various texts uh, that have been written on him since the early 1980s. And it's, you know, the methodology that he's developed over the years is clearly a big influence. But having said that, um, he himself was influenced by quite a few people uh, as well. You know, Ben Graham is the one that most people refer to. He was the uh, you know, sort of father of value uh, uh, analysis in, in investment. But there are other people as well. Charlie Munger, Philip Fisher, uh, author of Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits, um, is, a, is a pretty big influence. I think they uh, influenced him to move away from a pretty pure value approach into one that looked at the quality of the business he was investing in. And uh, so, you know, their influence is on him and, and on me. And I've met through, I mean, I was a broker and an analyst for 20 years before I, I kind of kicked off in this. And um, during that period, I marketed uh, my research and investment uh, research systems to pretty much everybody that you'd heard of at that point. So I met an awfully large number of people. And I would say part of it that, that I do is a synthesis out of some of the people that I met doing that, uh, I would say. So, you know, there was a very influential team, for example, Morgan Stanley Asset Management in London, who had uh, two or three very talented individuals working there who variously spun out and did uh, other things. Uh, Dominic Cordicott, who became the chairman of uh, Finsbury Growth Trust, uh, Andy Brown, who founded a firm called Cedar Rock, uh, William Locke, I think is still there, uh, Pete Wright, I'm not sure, but maybe still be there. Um, people in the United States as well, um, people like David Wintergreen, uh, Tom Russo, Russo Gardner, Tom Schrager at Tweedy Brown, which of course the firm that Warren Buffett uh, worked at. Uh, you know, I've really, you know, had a, an opportunity. I mean, I've worked with a lot of people. I've worked with a lot of the great shorts as well, Jim Chanos at Kinnacross and, and others going back, you know, longer in time in terms of the, the principles of the, the Soros business, for example. Um, and I would say what I've tried to do to a degree is educate myself and take some of the best bits that I saw of that that I could see worked and that I thought I could make work. Hi, Terry. Could you run through your investable universe? How many good companies are there versus bad companies? And what are the qualities that you look for that you think makes a good business? Yeah, sure. Well, I'm not going to run through every stock in the investable universe, otherwise we'll take up the entirety of the remainder of your interview to do that. It's got about 70 companies in it. It doesn't vary an awful lot. Sometimes it goes up one or two when there's a spin out or we discover something new. Uh, like Otis Elevator, for example, is in there and wouldn't have been in there a bit over a year ago uh, because it was part of United Technologies and we didn't want any exposure to Sikorsky helicopter and things like that. And sometimes we lose companies from it as well, typically by takeover and uh, things disappear there. So it changed an awful lot over time. There aren't that many really good companies, in my view. I mean, we may not have the right number there. I mean, bear in mind, we've got a size cap as well. We can't own uh, micro cap companies or, or small, even small cap companies that would qualify. But once you take a size cut off, you know, we've got approximately what I regard as the number of, of good businesses in the world. What makes a good business? I mean, first of all, just to define it financially, I think it basically is a business that makes a high return on, on capital employed. Without that, you're not going anywhere um, in terms of actually creating value. Uh, you know, I, I too can run a business for you with a low return on capital if you're silly enough to give me the capital, as it were, um, which people do, of course, regularly with businesses. Um, the other thing is it has to have a source of growth. No good having a high return on capital unless there's some sort of growth in which you can retain at least a portion of the returns you're generating and reinvest them at a similar rate. You need both those things. It's no good having growth without returns. It's no good having returns without growth. You need, they're basically two pillars, uh, financial pillars of this kind of business. And um, I, I could go through a, a number of subsidiary things, but those are really the two essentials. Operationally, I would say we like a business that makes its, its revenues from a large number of repeat, relatively predictable transactions, not Will they discover oil? Um, will they get a contract to do a huge project? Uh, will it work? Will they make money? Will the movie make money? I don't know. They don't know either. Um, we like you know, people who supply 
our everyday necessities and luxuries that we use without thinking about it in our business lives, in our personal lives as consumers and so on and so forth. And we like companies who've got some kind of defensive mechanism, because if you discover companies that have got great returns on capital and a source of growth and all this, there's naturally they will attract competition. I mean, that's kind of one of the laws of economics. And what you're looking for is the people who've got what Warren Buffett has, has termed the moat, and that's become, I think, a somewhat overused term, but nonetheless, since I haven't thought of a better one, I'd better stick with it, really, um, with some means of fending off the company. How do you stop people coming and, and eating your lunch? And typically, it's things like brands, uh, control of supply chain, control of distribution, installed bases of equipment or software that are difficult to change, uh, and, and know-how, uh, patents, uh, those are the sort of things which typically give you the ability to fend off the competition and retain those great returns. And I mean, some of the companies in our portfolio have been doing this for a century. They clearly have got a defensive mechanism. You mentioned there Warren Buffett and that you look for a high return on capital employees. Well, back in 1979, Warren Buffett described return on capital employees as the primary test of managerial economic performance and yeah. not the achievement of consistent gains in earnings per share. So why does the investment industry not follow this advice? I mean, this is this is a guy you should probably listen to. <laughs> so trying to do something that, uh, that flies in the face of this fundamental tenet of his is clearly not right. Um, I, it's, I, I always have this sort of blind bet with my audience. I say, if you're the recipient of uh, company research from a, from a, a broker platform or research house, I'll, I'll bet you 20 pounds, right, that if you get the last 10 notes out that you've received, if it says the primary thing they're relying upon in assessing the company is uh, one of them, if one of them says it's return on capital employed, you've won 20 pounds, okay? Now, my guess is I'll own the 20 pounds when you look through the 10 notes. So I'll give you a double or quiz. All of them will mention growth in earnings per share. Now, I'll be 40 pounds better off on average, on most of those bets. It's, it's an amazing thing that people don't look at it. Uh, and they'll come up with all kinds of uh, reasons why, because, you know, they, they, still, if you listen to analyst calls, um, they talk about whether something's accretive to earnings. Given that interest rates are currently approximate zero, you pretty much would have to get money and flush it down the toilet in terms of a project to not make it accretive to earnings, right? The P, the P on cash is about 150. Yeah, anything you do better than that must be accretive to earnings, but it doesn't create value. 